If you're a parent, teacher, or school leader, and you're sick and tired of the frustration, anger, and unfair treatment of children at high risk in our public schools, then perhaps it's time for all of us to do something about it. In this podcast, Dr. Amitra Berry brings you tips, tools, strategies, and tactics to build successful solutions while touching, moving, and inspiring all of us to transform our schools so that every child thrives. Here's your host, Dr. Berry. Welcome back, Equity Warriors, and thanks for tuning in. Today, I'm going to call attention to the significance of Black male achievement in K-12 education, and I have a guest, as you can see. My guest today is Andrew McGee, who has more than 32 years of educational experience. He served in Savannah, Chatham, and Cobb County, and Tennessee's Achievement School Districts as an educator, assistant principal, Title I coordinator, federal program director, and the deputy superintendent. You might think he can't keep a job, but he can always just moving up. He's now an author and school improvement consultant. He has transformed school improvement plans to benefit all students. Andrew's leadership has created avenues for marginalized students to thrive. He's an author of the book, A Champion Within, and Andrew champions opportunities for all students, irrespective of their background. Andrew, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. So I want to start by asking you to sort of set the stage um, and share how from an historical context, the history of racial discrimination in the U.S. has impacted black male achievement in K-12 education. Uh, thank you. Here, here's let, let, let me set the stage for you. Historically, when you look at this here, black, black males have been systemically denied access to equal education. And notice I underline the word equal education. Here's the thing is that many times we feel or they feel, and let me identify who are they, teachers in education feel that us as black males are inferior of not understanding or misrepresented or misunderstood. And so that's one of the things that is a key component. The other piece is unequal access and quality education, unequal access and quality education. Here you go back to when the no child left behind. Well, no child left behind didn't leave the funds behind to support education for all students. That was an unlevel playing field. The other thing that comes to mind is segregation and underfunding. Here we have separate but unequal education facilities. What I mean by that, you have a Title I school, you have a non-Title I school. Mm -hmm. And see, in identifying those non-Title I schools where the funding is available. In the, non -title, in the Title I school, you have funding that are limited, especially for Black males or male students of color. And so I have to emphasize male students of color for Title I, which are using federal dollars to provide support to hopefully increase the level playing field for black males and male students of color. Then the other thing you have is discriminatory practices, policies and practices. Although it may seem that black students which are lower level classes. And I talk about that in the book, what policies and practices is that in the book, the young man drew attended school and were not able to attend some of the classes that his counterpartners were able to attend. And this here again is discriminatory policies and practices where it was not fair. <clears throat> he wasn't, he didn't have the opportunity to engage in the high level courses, the gifted courses where you don't have a lot of male, black males or black students represented in the program. And then the other thing I think about is cultural relevance. Here is that the curriculum and teaching method in the school system, and even today, does not provide the opportunity to have a level playing field for cultural relevance. Do not allow opportunity for students that look like me that attend school to have other representation in the school so that part of that will be available for students to feel part of. And then you have the socioeconomic disparity. Here's the other thing is that though my zip code may be different, 
And though I may live across the street, economically disadvantaged students, marginalized students still have another burial that they have to face. So when you look at that, then you begin to wonder, okay, here's the history of racial discrimination in the U.S., which impact male students' achievement for K-12, which at the end you start looking at is that why aren't we graduating from high school? Why aren't we moving from middle to high school? But then you ask the question, we spend more dollars, more funds in building prison than we do in education. So that's what you have there. That's a lot. There's the, you could say it is beyond a full plate. It is. Um, it, it is. So we're going to, if we had four hours, we could dive into all of that. Um, I read your book, A Champion Within, and in it, you talk about role models and you even have the readers, which, you know, your book is targeted at young males, sort of as a workbook. And you ask them to identify four role models as they develop their own plan for success. Now, I have to share, my mother did her dissertation on the impact of black male role, role models or black male vice principals as role models for black males in secondary education, particularly got to get all of that together. You know, those dissertation titles are. And that was, gosh, that was like 25, 30. It's been a long time since that was written. And I don't think much has changed. But share with us, please, how significant is the role of black male educators and administrators in influencing the achievement levels Let's leave discipline aside for right now, but in, a, in influencing the achievement levels of black male students. Well, one of the things we have to have in our school system, and we have to do this systemically, is that first of all, we've got to understand that there is a call to have more black role models into the schools mm -hmm. so that we, and when I say we, male students of color, whether it's Hispanic, whether it's black, whether it's white, so that they will be able to see that we do exist. Yes. And so when we exist, then we begin to become acquainted, acquainted with that role model. Now, here's the thing I've got to emphasize is that I'm not saying that we need to put a whole lot of role models in the school that's not doing anything. I'm simply advocating that the role models that we put into the school must have an impact on our black males and our male students of color. I talk about in the book where this young man drew that I talk about his entire K through 11. He only had two black administrators, one elementary and one high school. And he only had one black teacher in his elementary schools journey. The thing that we have to make sure that we do is advocate for empowerment. What I mean by that is that when we attract positive role models into the school system, then we begin to get these educators and administrators to advocate for policies and practice that addresses the need for us. What do I mean by that? I mean that the curriculum can be centered around critical thinking that will get us part of looking at the way we think. All, this is not a one-stop shop. Yeah. This is an opportunity now to have us become part of a support system. And I talk about that in the book, that we need to have a support system. The other thing is building trust and connection. Hey, here's a commercial break. <laughs> we don't always connect with our opposite color, females, white. So what I'm simply saying is that when we build that opportunity to build trust with male students of color, that begins to get a part of us where we now say, hey, we build trust, we build a support system. Now let's move to the next stage there. And so cultural relevance is very important so that black males will have that opportunity to start at the bottom of the, to start at the ground level building themselves up where black role models are a part of K-12, not just high school, but elementary, middle, and high school. Yeah, it's unusual to see a man of color, one is an elementary teacher, particularly a lower, lower elementary teacher, and kindergarten is extremely rare. In all my years, I have only met one black man who was a kindergarten teacher, and he left 
the classroom, stayed in education, but was out of the classroom. And I also think to something, actually, I just wrote, I'm working on a new book, and I was writing about this in one of the chapters that when I taught high school, my Southeast Asian kids, um, particularly my Vietnamese kids, did not have a Vietnamese teacher, administrator, hall monitor, nothing on campus. And so they came to me and asked me to be the sponsor of the Vietnamese club. They had no one that identified with any Southeast Asian culture on this very large, comprehensive high school campus that was very diverse. So I know our children are not, especially our boys are not seeing those models that they connect with culturally. And it's not just our black boys that we are very much focused on, but our Latinos and our Asian children as well. They're just not seeing those. So important not just to have a body there, but someone that has an impact, someone that understands and someone that they can connect to. You started talking about curriculum. And so there are days when I just, I don't want to turn on the TV. I don't want to look at the briefs in my email because there's not a day that goes by anymore that I don't see something that is attempting to erase people of color and especially black people, erase them from curriculum, from standards, from frameworks, and especially in two states that I'm sick and tired of calling out. So I'm not going to say their names, but the first letters are T and F. So, um, yeah. (laughs) So uh, what are your thoughts on the importance of adopting or adapting curriculum to be more culturally relevant and engaging, particularly for black male students, but also for our Latino and Asian students as well? You know, and and, and I'm glad you didn't call out those states, but uh, we (laughs) both identify those states. Here's the thing, and and I've shared with committees and, and now education arena, is that if we don't begin now, to build a framework that include all ethnic groups, then what you will find is that you won't have a program or a framework that will cater to all people. Now, here's the important piece about that. I believe that we should incorporate a diverse perspective. This here is to integrate a wide range of voices, authors, filmmakers, text, history. Now, I've got to pause pause there for a second because in my book, I talk about Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was the very first African-American male that I encountered. And I only encountered him in middle school when my middle school teacher, Mrs. Clark, came to us and said, hey, here is some literature. Here is some poetry that you all need to begin to digest and become familiar with. Because the world is a big place that encompasses a lot. And so it was there where I began to understand and began to read poetry of people that look like me. The other thing is we need to highlight our cultural contribution. We do more than sing, dance, and play sports. And, 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 <laughs> and Black History Month. And, and we, 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 we do. We do more than sports. We do more than just get recognized in the awards winner, whatever it is. But see, here's the thing. We've got to incorporate cultural contributions so that people like you, people like I, ethnicity with Hispanics can understand that there is people like us that have contributed positively to our community and society. The other thing is that we got to foster students' voice and choice. What I mean by that is provide opportunity for students to explore topics that interest them. Here's the thing. They need to write their narrative. But if they can't write their narrative and if they can't understand where they came from or where they are trying to go, their narrative will not be complete. And so what I've said to them is that you are a champion. And if you are a champion, you are in power to write your narrative and nobody can write your narrative as well as you. And then the other thing that I would do is to interact, interactive learning. It's important that we incorporate personal narratives and stories of black Americans that have contributed to society so that they will see that there is more than Barack Obama. There's more than Oprah Winfrey. There's more than Michael Jordan. There's more than Kobe, there's more. They need to know that the sky is a limit. And I talk about that in my book. And I and a teacher told me and says, well, the sky is the limit. And so that person, Drew, said, if the sky is the limit, it is 
I am about to test, reach the sky because I believe that I can do everything that I put my hands to do. So there's where the curriculum is. Hey there, Equity Warriors. I want to take a quick moment to share something exciting with you. You know how passionate I am about equity and education, right? Well, I've created a special space, a safe space, where we can dive even deeper into these crucial topics. It's our Patreon channel, and I'd love for you to join me there. Here's why it's so awesome. As a Patreon subscriber, you'll get access to exclusive content that I will not share anywhere else. I'm talking additional insights, workshops like you would get in regular professional learning sessions, resources that can really amplify your impact in education. But it's more than just extra content. By subscribing, you are directly supporting our mission. You're helping to create more valuable discussions and resources that you've come to love. You're part of the change we're making in educational systems. And let me tell you, our Patreon community It is something special. It's a place where passionate educators and advocates can come together, share ideas, and drive real change. So if you're ready to take your commitment to educational equity to the next level, I'd be thrilled to have you join me. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash 3E podcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash 3E podcast. Remember, your support means the world to me, and it helps me continue this important work. Together, we can create the educational system all our students deserve. Thanks for considering. And now let's get back to the episode. Yeah, you know, I review curriculum material um, as part of what I do as a business. And I received a book this weekend, and I'm going to go ahead and call it out. It was Gib Smith, which is a small boutique publisher, sent me a copy of their new Black Studies, not African American, but Black Studies. And I tell you, that was the first thing that caught my attention. And I loved it because they talk about Black people in the United States, whether we are Afro-Latino, Afro-Caribbean, the skin color has impacted the experience and the commonality of the experience. But going through this text as they laid it out and telling the story of people from diverse perspectives, diversity of art, that we are not monolithic, that um, we are experience has a lot of similarities, but even there, there are tremendous differences, but all the rich history and contributions to mathematics, to the sciences, not just to the arts which and sports, like I said, sing, dance and, and shoot a ball, that there's more to it than that. And I think that when we have publishers like that, and I said, good job, you know, might have a good time trying to sell that in the T state and the F state. That's going to be a little bit difficult. But as more and more publishers use appropriate language and tell the full story of people of color, that is when we will have true American history or U.S. history Mm. with that diversity of perspectives and voice. And our students have some choice as to what they learn and how comprehensively they can understand this country that we live in called America. I want to stay on academics for another minute. Here in America, and I, I state which country because I do have listeners from a, around the world, and I imagine the same is true across Canada. I have worked in Canada a little bit and Europe and Australia for my listeners from those parts of the world, that non-Hispanic white people make up the vast majority of teachers. Here in the U.S., it's roughly 80%. It's a little higher in elementary than in secondary. In elementary and primary schools, those non-Hispanic white people, and very clear non-Hispanic white people, also tend to be women. So we have Black boys who come to school and may not see a Black man or woman in an academic role for much of their formative years. And that's not to say that all white people are biased. People who know me know that that is not what I believe, but that we all do carry implicit bias. And the way that our brains work, they receive bias messages from the world that we live in. And that means that we develop and too often can perpetuate stereotypes. It happens to all of us. It happens to me, to you, to every teacher that's out there. We have to work against those messages and always look at what it is we're doing to avoid perpetuating, internalizing and perpetuating those stereotypes. So how does 
that societal stereotyping or the societal stereotype of black males affect their academic performance because they're hearing it. They live in this country. They see it all the time. And then what strategies can you give me a couple of strategies that educators and administrators can use to combat that? I can. First of all, it has a big impact on their academic performance because first they recognize that there's nobody in here that looks like me that I need to be encouraged or empowered to do what I need to do to make it happen. <clears throat> in my book, I talk about a young lady that was a part of my support system. That lady did not look like me, but she understood the stereotype and she understood the dynamic of what I would be going through. And she took me under her wings. The very first thing strategies that I will suggest, the first strategy I will suggest will be positive reinforcement. Why? Is because, first of all, I've got to build relationship with you. And as you stated, there are more non-Black teachers in the schools, especially in elementary. When you get to middle school, the chances are going down, high school as well. And so what we do is we build a positive reinforcement. And how do we do that? I'm glad you asked. We provide positive feedback. We say to Johnny that I believe in you. And if you believe in Johnny, you're going to be a part of that support system. That's one. The other strategy I believe in is high expectation. I expect what I inspect is that once you build that trust in Johnny and I, Johnny understand that there is a expectation of what to become of Johnny is that Johnny also has high expectation for himself as well. But what you want to do is to make sure you build on that. And then diverse role model. Here, if you are the opposite of, of me, if, if my teacher is white, what I could do as that white female teacher is begin to build a bank of role models that looks like him. And I've done this uh, in schools that I've contracted with, is that there may be a person crossed in the middle school, if I'm teaching elementary, that doing his planning time that he could come over to to support this person or to be the role model, being able to have an ear so that he could speak with it. Then the other thing is active engagement. Another strategy is that all of us don't learn alike. So we've got to understand that just because I can't sit in my seat when you tell me to sit in my seat, that doesn't mean that I can't learn that I'm not listening. It just means that I have a different learning style and that's OK to be different. The other thing is you've got to build self-confidence, build self-confidence with that person. Our black male students of color, our male students of color, uh, whether Hispanics, uh, non-white, doesn't matter. They need to have the understanding that they have self-worth and building self-confidence. And I used to tell the kids all the time uh, in school is that I want you to become not just a champion. I want you to become special. And every morning that creed, we would say, I'm special. I am me. I can accomplish anything. If it's to be, it's up to me. No goal is too high. I am special. I am me. And so they took a part of it. They invested in that. And so that was another strategy. And then the other strategy that I will recommend is personal learning. Yes, personal learning. We need to tell her that learning. We talk about curriculum when you know you do a pre-test, post-test, you do an evaluation, you know how Johnny learned. And so you want to personalize Johnny learning so that if Johnny needs that after school tutorial, then you want to make sure Johnny get that support that he needs. And then the biggest thing is professional development for teachers. Yes, professional development for teachers. So the professional development for teachers will understand that that diverse learning is just not just one color, it's all of us. And it's just not one learning, it's not a one-stop shop, it's a learning opportunity to be a part of where you begin to learn other cultures and then you are able to take that learning and implement it into your classroom. All right. Yes. You and I are singing the same song. Um, and for, you know, you touched on one thing and that is how teachers see 
whether or not or believe whether or not students are engaged based on their behavior. Um, and it's something I come across quite often when I'm working with with educators and very often they will call out their boys of color or their black boys in particular about their behavior in the classroom. And I said, you know, what? we don't all learn the same way and we can't expect what I often do is I will invite an audience that maybe does not have much cultural experience. I ask them if they've ever been to a Black Baptist or AME church. Because if you want to know how we engage, how we learn, how we speak to a speaker, even though the the white narrative is that you sit back and you passively listen and you don't say anything, that is not our culture. And so what you're trying to do is erase the culture of the children that come into your classroom when you tell them that's not how you learn. Yes, it is how they learn. It's not how you learn. So take a, a dip into a cultural experience and then come away with something that you have never had before. And I can tell you there there are those who have taken my advice and they come back and they're like, I'm never going to a white church again. That was fun. You know, it's like, that's not what I was trying to get you to do, but I'm glad you are recognizing that there are some differences in the way we learn and engage in the exact same or very close to the same information. I also thought of something. I had to go find it, so I did not misquote as we were, were talking about that and and the the impact of, of sort of that societal racism and stereotyping on our boys. And it was something that Dr. Huey P. Newton said. He said that our youths are passed through schools that don't teach, then forced to search for jobs that don't exist, and finally left stranded in the street to stare at the glamorous lives advertised around them. So they are living in this world where they are seeing these are the things that that mean that you've made it. These are the things that that show that you have worth. And yet very often or too often, they're not receiving an education that will prepare them to get to that point. And some of that education is in the soft skills and some of that that soft skills work impacts discipline. So I do want to go there. I'm going to stay away from it because it's too easy to go down that down that uh, rabbit hole and not come out. Um, I have done several shows on the topic of discipline in, in one form or another. You know, we have disproportionality and suspensions and expulsions that cannot be denied. We have over policing in our majority of color schools, something else that can't be denied. We have black males who disproportionately have encounters with the justice system because of behaviors that are overlooked time and time again when white boys engage in them. And some of that is because of who staffs our schools. And, you know, that's a whole other topic. But from your context, how do those disciplinary disparities affect black males education trajectories? And then what solutions do you see schools implementing to address that? I'm glad you asked that. And this is <clears throat> what we, what I have gathered from my experience working with them. I've had the experience of working with the Department of Juvenile Justice with those students. Yeah. And so moving from traditional school system to non-traditional school system where male students of color or black boys are locked up and an alarming rate of students just in school system. But the first thing that I see is that it has a big impact on academic disruption. What do I mean by that? Well, if you suspend me, if you expel me, even expulsion, and, and, and I understand the caveat for expulsion is that we put you into another program. But then that interrupts my academic disruption right there. And so that causes us or them to miss valuable classroom time or instruction that will put them behind in school. That's one thing. The other thing that I'm cognitive of, of is that the negative school climate is that we create a hostile and unwelcoming school environment for black males, especially when students are leading disengagement or reduced motivation and lack the connection with learning. I talked a little about that in the, in the book. If you don't engage me in the learning, if you have a hostile school experience or culture where Blacks does not feel part of the education system, then you have a negative school climate. 
-hmm. And what you do is you put another opportunity for us to get into other things that are not positive. And then from there leads to another piece that pipe to uh, the pipeline to jail. The other thing is, is that loss of instruction. I don't care how many times you give a student makeup work. It is not the same as direct instruction. Now, direct instruction in my 32 years, Dr. Berry, to me, direct instruction as a former teacher is that you in front of my class and that you get the opportunity to encompass a wide range of opportunity of learning in the classroom. And so a loss of instruction does not represent the same as makeup work. That's loss of instruction. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the increased likelihood of dropping out. If you suspend me over and over and over and over, or if you continue to have a climate, a climate that is conducive to negativism, when you put those two together, you have no opportunity for me to be successful. And so the next thing happened is that dropout increases, juvenile detention center increases, but at the same time, you are writing a school improvement plan or a consolidated plan that incorporates active learning. And your goals is to increase graduation rate and to increase parent participation. But you can't do that when you don't have anything, anybody there. Now, yeah. let's look at some solutions for that. One of the solutions I would have is positive behavior interventions and support. We talk about that PBIS. Now, I'm not I'm not advocating the PBIS. What I am advocating is that you have a program set up where students are successful in reducing the rate of suspension, increasing the rate of graduation, increasing the rate of attendance. When boys look like me, Hispanics and so forth feel that they are welcome that they feel part of the program, that they feel that what they say is being heard, that changes the dynamic of things. Yeah. And then here's the other thing, mentoring and support program. I talked about earlier is that when we talked about No Child Left Behind, the funds weren't left behind. So what I encourage schools now is with these federal dollars that we have and Title I schools, use those funds to begin an active after school program that is conducive to increasing students' learning. Notice I said conducive to increasing student learning. I'm not saying we're going to do the same thing, tutorial, by no means, because tutorial is not doing what it need to be that need to be done. And so then also develop a mentoring program. I'm convinced from reading that book, and and, 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 I, and I'm going to give you the secret, is that it was me. That The little boy was me. I'm convinced that when you invest role models, when you invest, and I talk about the academic, I had to go to tutoring. Mm -hmm. I had to step away from basketball. That was my favorite. I'll tell you that now. And then I had to build a culture of music, learning how to do something different that we normally don't do across the track. And so when we implement those solutions, I think that the dynamics of way we used to do things will change. And here, here's a commercial on that newsflash. Students not changing. No. <laughs> Hello, no. students not changing. So professional development has to be a big piece of for teachers so that they can begin to understand that we've got to transition or we've got to be able to transform to a way we can reach those students. And then the other thing that I talk about is that another solution would be family engagement. I truly believe that when we invest in family engagement, you want your, your parents to come to be a part of the schools. Well, Here's the thing, when you're building and writing or revising or developing your comprehensive needs assessment, your school improvement plan, there's a great time to invite a parent to be a part of that team. There's a great opportunity to invite the parent to be a part of the parent engagement 
piece because they then begin to understand how school work. And then that parent engagement piece is starting to do conferencing. We've got to change the way we do conferencing because you can't get me into a school and you're going to sit behind your desk or sit in your classroom and tell me that you value my child. We've got to redo the way we do things because students are changing. And so those are the solutions there that I would have. But here's the other thing. Addressing these disparities require, requires approach that involves a collaboration. We've got to collaborate with our stakeholders. We've got to talk with our administrators, our teachers. We've got to talk to our family, our community. The goal is to provide support. And then in providing support, we've got to have a system in place that include all learners, so that they all have an opportunity to be successful. Because at the end of the day, as I would, and, and I did that as a director of federal program for the Department of Juvenile Justice. I said, I can't have these students leaving us the same way they came in here. And so I had the autonomy to work with the funds, distribute funds through curriculum, through after school, through programs that best fit them. And for those that may not have a visual of, of getting a high school diploma, you can get a certificate. For those that did not get a certificate, hey, let's look at a trade. I was willing to put the funds where the needs were. And that's what one of the solutions or several solutions that I would suggest. I want to add one thing to your parents. Parent engagement is huge. It's crucial. But we also have to understand as educators, again, we can go to that culture piece that not every culture believes that they should be involved in the schools. I always I, I sort of make it, you know, if we think about medicine, we take our children to the doctor and we trust that the doctor is the professional. We don't typically go in there and say, here's what's wrong with my child. Now prescribe the drug I tell you to, tr to prescribe. We respect their profession. And because of that, there's a little bit of a, a hands-off approach to their practice. Many cultures believe that the teacher or an educator is a, a much respected and revered position. They're a professional. And so they don't feel that it's appropriate for the parent to go to the school at all. That's one. Mm -hmm. The other is to recognize, I always say respect, affirm, and value the fact that some of our parents are working multiple jobs or they're working shifts. They cannot come to the school when it's convenient for the school to have them. They may need to come to the school at an off hour when it's inconvenient for the, the educators, but convenient for the parent. And so if you really value that parent connection, you have to understand and respect and make arrangements to serve the parents, not yourselves in creating that parent engagement piece. That's just always a big thing with me because I was a I was that parent that was on the school site council. I was on the superintendent's advisory committee. I was on the PTA. I was there and understanding because other parents would tell me here are my challenges, how important it is for us to really listen to the parents in our communities and make our plans and our, our schools welcoming to them, not our convenience, but theirs. Anyhow. I digress. Like. One last question for you. You know, I always sign off with a paraphrase of, I call her the great Dr. Angela Davis. And she said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. So I have to ask you, what is the thing that you cannot accept? And what can our listeners do to support that change? I can no longer accept black males not having a vision. I can't. And so that is what we're beginning to change, because I truly believe if you give them a vision, they will prosper. If you give them a vision, they will prosper. We've got to be the voice for the voiceless and that are them. They need us to be the voice for them. We need to advocate. Advocate for policy change. If you are a board member or you running for a board member position, or if you are uh, a stakeholder in the community, we've got to advocate a change. Because here's the thing, and that's why I said champions, because when you feel that you're a champion, you feel empowered. Because what I don't want is 
less money going to education and more money going to prison and jail. I can't accept that. But what I can accept is that I'm a champion within. And so the other thing that I could use and could get others to help out is that when you see little black boys or male students of color, encourage them. It it really doesn't. It's it's not a rocket science. Doesn't take much. It 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 it, it isn't. You know, I used to tell as as an administrator, I would tell the teachers, female teachers, if you want the boys to be on your side, pat them on the back and encourage them. That's what they want, and they will protect you. The other thing is, and you don't have to physically pat them. (laughs) No, 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 no. Don't physically pat them. Not physically. Encourage them. them. Yeah. Encourage them. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> and, and here's the other thing. Support education initiatives. Because many times those that are champions may not have experience outside the school or may not have experience outside the community. And so if they have not, suggest and recommend books or technology use that they can use or or suggest a, a field trip or invite somebody into the classroom. Because one of the things, Dr. Barry, that I encourage and that I took advantage of is that uh, I didn't see anybody that looked like me that were in those jobs. And so my two support system, especially the one, the white lady that I'm talking about, what she did was she connected me with somebody. Mm-hmm. And that somebody motivated me, encouraged me to, hey, stay the course. And so what I say is, remember, we're in this thing together. I'd much rather put money into education than to put it into the pipeline that leads these students from education to the prison pipeline. Well, That's I say it is, cheaper to, it is cheaper to educate than it's to incarcerate. Cheap. Right. Because, hey. Right. You don't know who's going to be at your house. But what I would like to know is that I got a doctor that's taking care of me because it's something that we've done along the way. So that's why we become champions, champions for change. That's awesome. I'm going to put the contact information for Andrew's book down in the show notes, along with his contact information. Um, Maybe I said that wrong. His contact information and how you can purchase the book um, down in the show notes. Andrew, thanks for joining me. It's, um, you know, we could talk for hours, but uh, we'd lose we'd lose listeners. And I want to thank you, Equity Warriors, for joining us today. Connect with me on social using the links down in the show notes. Send me your questions, topics and requests to info at AskDrBerry.com. That's a new email. It's info at AskDrBerry.com. Remember to like, share, subscribe, Vote like your life depended on it because it just might. And as always, don't worry about the things you cannot change. Change the things you can no longer accept. And I'll see you next time. That's it for today's episode of the 3E Podcast. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. One lucky listener every single week that posts a review on iTunes will win a chance in a grand prize drawing to win a $25,000 value private VIP day with Dr. Barry herself. Be sure to head over to 3epodcast.com and pick up a free copy of Dr. Barry's gift. Then join us on the next episode.